All right, I was at home with a girlfriend. Um, we both had children who were almost six and three-year-olds. And they had come over to play for the day after school. And my friend's name was Marilyn. And she was going to leave the house about 3 o'clock. And around that time, we looked out the window, and it was, the weather was getting really crazy out there. It looked, it looked like a tornado was coming. It looked like a hurricane was coming. I need to read. <laughs> yeah. Where do I, if I start so you, can, you can say, if you had, okay. you kind of paused when uh, you said you had um, your kids um, there. They're about six. Mm -hmm. So why don't you start by saying, um, you know. Where well, Marilyn um, was going. Marilyn was okay. over. Yeah. Okay. My friend Marilyn was over. And with her two kids and my two kids who were in school together. Um, the two older ones, a little girl and my older, she had two girls, I had two boys. Uh, the two girls, uh, <laughs> we're going to start off. <laughs> I'll get going and then and we'll we be can, fine. We yeah. Yeah. All, when, you, when you pause, okay. do that helps us piece it together if we have to. Okay. Um, I had invited my friend Marilyn to come over after the kids get out of school. Um, we each had a kindergartner. They were, Karen was almost six, and so was my Michael. The two younger ones were three, uh, not a little girl and boy. Um, Marilyn was ready to leave the house. It was time for her to go home, and we looked outside, and we could see that the weather was really crazy out there. And I said to her, you know, it looks like a hurricane out there, but they predict hurricanes, so it's obviously not a hurricane. But why don't you, why don't you wait? Don't go home yet until the weather calms down a little. And at that point, the weather was not calming down. It definitely started to pick up, and I could see the table on my porch with the umbrella start to lift up and off the table. And I had done that previously times, and I'd gone outside and kind of grabbed the table, and I'm like, mm, I'm not going outside this time. It looks like more than that. Um, then we saw a wire fall. We, we, by looking out the back window, we saw this wire come down. It shot off sparks, and the whole house went dark because the power went out. Somehow, all the kids came into the kitchen. I don't know where they'd been playing before, if they were in one of the bedrooms. Could have even been in the front room. And they came into the room just as the house got suddenly very, very dark, um, unusually dark for that time of day. And all of a sudden, I hear my front windows smashing, breaking in. <laughs> to this day, when I hear brass glass break, unexpectedly, I. I I tense up because when I heard my windows breaking in, I knew we had gone beyond normal. It was, I, I had children in my arms, but it was too dark to see. I didn't know if they were my kids or Marilyn's kids. It got too dark to see anything. It was too loud to hear anything. I mean, they talk about a train engine coming. I didn't hear a train. It was just too, it was beyond my hearing level. It was just too loud to hear and too dark. I, I don't ever remember it being that dark in my whole life. And we felt, suddenly felt this crushing weight on us. Um, and I knew that I, I was, I, my, my, I had children's heads in my arms and I was squeezing my arms so hard, I thought it was going to crush their heads. But there was nothing I could do about it because everything was coming down on us. I have no idea how long it lasted. Probably seconds. I mean, those things move really, really fast. And I was underneath all of this debris with two little kids, and I knew Marilyn was beside me. And I, I, I didn't know what was going on with her or the kids. I just knew that we were under this tremendous amount of stuff, and I'm thinking, as, as, it push, as the tornado was pushing down on us, I could feel one of my legs bent underneath me in a wrong way. And I thought, first I thought, my leg is going to break. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm not even going to live through this. This is, this is where we're going to die. This is it. We're, we're, this is going to kill us. At some point, I understood it was a tornado, and I, I 
Don't know when, I just knew. And when, when the, the noise had passed, and, I, and the pressure was no longer coming down on us, I figured, I, I don't know if, if I stopped to think about being stuck under there or not, but all of a sudden I realized that Marilyn had moved. She had managed to get herself out from underneath the debris somehow, which then released me and the two children that were with me. I found out later, Marilyn understood she had only one child in her hands. And she knew she was missing, and she knew that the one she had was her daughter, but she didn't have the other one. And it was kind of like superhuman mom strength, this adrenaline that she kind of gave a push with her back and released herself from underneath the debris. My house was a, was a raised ranch. So the back of the house was like two stories. She managed to jump off the back of the house. Now it's pouring rain. Heavy, heavy, heavy rain is pouring. She jumped off the back of the house. So it never occurred to her that she was jumping off over my hot water, which was spurting out. She actually got burned by the hot water as she jumped off the house. She didn't realize it for days that that's what happened to her. But she jumped off. She went around. To, to see if she could find the other child. She got to try to go around the debris. Found the, the other little girl trying to get into their car, into their van. Karen was almost six. She says that she saw my alarm is going off. I should have turned off again, sorry. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. I have an elderly mother who I call at 2 o'clock most days. So the alarm went off. <laughs> All right. Um, so Karen said that she saw the wall collapse on her mother and I and thought we were dead. Um, what I didn't say earlier was that there was a, a sofa bed in my living room. And this heavy, heavy sofa bed had come up, hit the kitchen wall, and came down on top of us. Somehow my kitchen table flipped over, and we found ourselves underneath the kitchen table, under the wall, under the sofa. The little girl saw this sofa do this, thought her mother and I were dead, and she went down my front stairs and out the door. When the house collapsed, my chimney collapsed on that stairwell. Don't know how that little girl made it out. She says she saw the funnel. Um, so when her mother went around to, to see if she could find her daughter, found her getting into the van, she came back to us. And by that time, I was able to get myself and the, uh, the three children that were still with me out from underneath this little area. I have a photograph of the back of the house that you can see where the kitchen table bridged on my open stove door. The store dove, the, the, the oven, the door to the oven opened, and the table bridged on that open door. We were underneath that, five of us. If the table hadn't bridged in that way, I don't think I'd be here talking to you. So she managed to, to crawl out from that, and then I was able to pass each of the children off to her and hand them down. And as I walked away, I, I, I looked at my house, and it was, it was just, well, it was like maybe 20% of the house was still there. You look at it, and you see um, the hardwood floor was there, but the whole carpet was gone. I mean, it had been wall to wall carpeting. The carpet was gone. Um, so we came around to the, the front of the house, and I'm thinking to myself, I have two live, healthy children, one in each hand. I don't care what happened in my house. I'm the luckiest person in the world. We all walked away from this. And it's been my attitude ever since. For me, life is just icing on the cake. I mean, I was supposed to die that day, and I didn't. So I, I've had a phenomenal attitude about life ever since because I got this extra. Oh, I think 
Okay. Um, that is incredible. Um, when you when you came around the house, did you were you aware of what was going on in your neighborhood? What what street did you live on? I lived on Hollowbrook. Oh God, yeah. Uh, I'm in the I'm in the corner of Hollowbrook and Oxcart, right behind the elementary school. So we were house number six maybe to go down. I think there was like one or two on the other side of the river. And then my whole cul-de-sac, one, two, three, four, five. And then it went straight up Hollowbrook from there. Um, when we came out to the front of the house, we could see there were other people kind of gathering in the street. One of the neighbors across the street, Trish, motioned to us to come across the street and she literally broke into the house across the street and we all went in because it was still pouring rain. She, um, she had a baby who was around a year old. When the storm started, she was afraid that the trees in the back were gonna fall on her house. And she took her sleeping baby out of the crib how many of us take a sleeping baby out of a crib? But she did. And it's the only reason she's got that child, because that crib was splintered all the way up and down the street. I mean, it was the whole crazy house was gone. And she grabbed that baby. Um, the, the people in the house next to her rode their hardwood floor like a flying carpet across the road. I have an aerial photo, and you can see their, their hardwood floor is on the lawn of the house across the street, and they rode it like a flying carpet. That's, uh, oh my God, that's incredible. Um, so we all, we all gathered in, in another house across the street, and oh, basically, we're, we were kind of, you know, in shock, and Trish kind of raided the house and grabbed blankets and things to wrap us all up in, and we must have been in there about... 20 minutes before somebody said, you know, we should make a call. And I'm like, how do you make a phone call? The wires must all be down. Turns out the phone lines were underground. And so the phones were working. And I picked up the phone and I called 911. And they didn't know what I was talking about. They just thought it was some crazy lady. They had no clue what had happened. There was no warning for this thing and nobody knew anything. They, they, so, I, I said that, you know, there, there are people who are, are injured. But, I mean, my leg had been bent under me in a weird way. I, I probably tore a ligament or something in the knee. And at this point, I didn't even know. I was just walking on the thing. Um, but I said, we, we need some help out here. We didn't know that at that time how extensive it had been. But you could see there were no houses standing on my side of the street. Across the street? Damaged houses, windows blown in, all kinds of stuff. My side was just gone. Um, and they said that they would send help. And, and at this point, we, we weren't hearing any sirens. Um, we just, but I was after I hung up with the police, I picked up the phone again. And I called my husband at work. And I said, the children and I are fine. The house is gone. <laughs> There's been a tornado. He says, I'm on my way home. He had been out to a business lunch, and he was like, he should never have gone behind the wheel of a car, but he flew home. He couldn't get the car any further than the bridge over the Farmington River. It was just solid debris. At that point, he got out of the car, and he walked through the debris, and he came to our neighbor's house, found me and the kids there, and we went off to a friend's house for the night. What was it like um, when you came back? So you went to a friend's house for the night, and when you real when you came back into the neighborhood, and, and maybe some of that adrenaline had worn yeah. off. Describe that feeling. It it looked like a bomb had gone off. It looked like we, we were in a, in a war zone. I mean, there was just stuff everywhere. There's all kinds of people's belongings all over my front lawn most of them weren't mine I didn't I uh, we tried to go back into some of the house to grab a few things that maybe we really needed to save or see if we could get out of there um, things like some photographs 
they happened to have been in a bedroom that was mostly gone, but we were able to get in and get, at, get the photographs out. So we have some of those things. I'm an artist, and I had a lot of artwork in the house that just gone. Um, but it was just, it was just, it, you, just, you just don't think of those things happening. How did you even start to clean up? What was the first thing you remember about going back there and, and what, how did you know well, what to do? Well, actually, my parents came down and they took me and the boys back to Boston. Um, by that time, I knew my leg was in difficult shape. And so my husband was kind of left to deal with most of the debris. He had a lot of survivor's guilt, you know. He was like, he wasn't there to protect his family, and he felt terrible. Um, and <laughs> he doesn't deal with stuff like this the best, so he kind of um, just, it, it was like, get rid of it all, and, and, and they came in and bulldozed down stuff. I don't, I don't really know who he talked to and what he did. I do know that some things that were salvageable he just said, get rid of, and I, I wish he hadn't. But we had neighbors up on Lighthouse Hill. Um, they, had, they had lived next to us until three months before, and then they moved up the street. Um, and so they said they could, would store things in their garage for us, but he didn't want to uh, impose, so he put very minimal stuff up there, and. Had I been there, mm, we might have done some things different. But how long were you up there in Boston and away from that about scene? About a week. So that when I came back, um, there was a lot of work had already been done. The amount of help that people gave us was unbelievable. The Red Cross came in. Um, the government came in and put tornado uh, put the government came in and put trailers on our on our front lawns um, uh, you know, I don't know how people build a house if they don't live right on the front lawn <laughs> so many things I caught when they were building the house back they have to be right there um, did did they have to um did they have to totally start over with your house, or could they, were they yeah. able to save it? They took the house right down clean to the foundation. Um, they told us the foundation was good, we could reuse it. Turned out to be not true. Um, the foundation cracked not long afterward, and we've had a number of problems ever since. The house is quite tipped. <laughs> had we known, we would have probably dealt with it, but we really, I mean, we'd only been in the house two and a half years. We didn't want to build something big and fancy that was way more money than we had planned on spending. So we stayed within what the SBA loan gave us, what insurance covered. Uh, we tried really hard to stay within budget. So we didn't deal with that foundation. And that was probably the biggest mistake. But but we were kids. I mean, I was 30 years old. You don't, and you don't, not planning to build a house. You, you, what, you don't to do. <laughs> what, um, how, how was that process, uh, if you, re if you recall, about uh, insurance and um, you know getting the loans? And I mean, was it, was it stressful? Was it, e did they make it easy for you? Our insurance was very good to us. They really were. Um, we had gotten a call from the insurance company just about a week before the tornado. And they said to us, um, would you like to upgrade from a replacement value, from depreciated value to replacement value? We said, sure, sounds good. We never paid a nickel on that. And they paid out on the replacement value as opposed to depreciated. They were pretty amazing to us. They were really good. Uh, some other neighbors were having trouble. I remember Ella Grasso came, um, and 
my husband was standing on what was left of our house and she was on the front lawn and she asked us how our insurance was treating us and we said very good and I, we said but the neighbors my husband said the neighbors next door are having trouble with their insurance and uh, El Grasso said uh, we'll have them call such and such and my husband said to her I said no you call she said okay <laughs> As far as we know, she did. <laughs> but what was your we, impression of her? Oh, she was really great. She was very good. I, I think whoever handled our tornado did a wonderful job. Um, but we were small. You know, we, we were declared a disaster area. We were 50 homes. But when you look at some of these other disasters, um, some of these hurricanes and, and things with huge swaths of area need help. I don't think they could get the, the attention, the individual attention that we got. We were really lucky in that sense. Um, do you feel like um, the, um, the sense of the neighborhood changed after the tornado? Was there, was there a closeness? Oh, yes, definitely. There was, there, was, there was a real closeness afterward. Um, there was like a little newsletter that came out, uh, kept us informed about what was going on. I don't remember it in too much detail, um, but we passed those around so that everybody would know what was going on. Uh, we checked in with each other. There was a lot, a lot of closeness. Um, at this point, it, that, that all, well, first of all, so many of those families no longer live there. But it lasted four or five years, and after that, it just kind of dissipated, and we went back to being not such a close group. I mean, no animosity. It's just life goes on. Yeah. But there is, there is a connection that will never quite go away, those of us who are, who are in it. Uh, Marilyn, who was in my house, uh, eventually moved to Glastonbury. Um, or, and, and we don't... Um, we don't talk very often, but we always check in on October 3rd, and I let her know that you guys were, were doing this, and um, there's, there's a connection that probably would, had, had uh, we not been together in the tornado, once the kids got older, I think that friendship might have just faded, but it doesn't, because it's a special connection. What do, you, what do you think of um, every October 3rd? I mean, does, do you go back to that day? Or, have, you know, obviously it's a traumatic event to go through. What, what, what you, you know, I'm probably a little bit unusual because I, I, as, as dramatic as it was and as much as, 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 a, as I say, things like breaking glass can startle me, I, I ended up with both of my children being fine. And as far as I was concerned, that was all that was important. I mean, uh, everything else. <laughs> on October 3rd, we have a strange <laughs> celebration on our family. Right before the tornado, we had, you know, we had two sons. We figured this is it. We're done having children. I had sold all my baby equipment on September 30th. It was, we had sold everything. We were done having kids. When I came so close to losing my two children, I suddenly needed to have one more child. I mean, if one of them had been lost, the other would be alone. I was like, I need another kid. And so every year on October 3rd, that's the kid that makes a big deal about it on Facebook, and he announces it that he was born because of the tornado. <laughs> so we have, we have a strange celebration. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, he's a vi he's the most outgoing and verbal of all my children. So, he's a blessing. Yeah, um, he's the blessing, and it was the best thing that could have come out of the tornado. So, how can I complain? I would do it. Do you remember how long it took uh, to for the cleanup and to and to get get back into your house? We were one of the first families to move back into a house which was about three months. I wish we'd gone a little slower. It, it, we would have some things that, you know, uh, we were just anxious to get back into the house. So if the builder said to me, well, if we do that, you know, it's gonna take longer, 
we didn't want it to take longer. We were, as I said, we were young, we were kids, and we were a little in, impatient. Um, so for us, it wasn't as long. Some families, it was almost a year. Depended upon who they had for builder and what they were doing, I guess. Um. your sense just maybe one what was your sense of afterwards um what people maybe just basic thing what, what did people need directly after the the tornado when in, in within those first two hours i mean uh, and, and people started coming into your neighborhood to help what was it uh were people walking around in shock were they uh, um we one of the we were all in one house as a group, and we, we definitely were in shock at the whole thing. Um, there were other families that we hadn't heard from. I knew the family next door to me was one of my closest friends. She'd grown up in the Midwest, and they didn't emerge from that house. Nobody came out, and I was really scared. I kept going outside to look and see, it, is she there? And I was calling and see turns out having grown up in the Midwest she recognized the dangerous sun she recognized what the sky meant that I didn't when my ears popped I turned to Marilyn and I said that means something but I didn't know what it means if you're standing still and your ears pop run for cover if you're in an airplane and they plop it's a different story if you're standing still your ears pop <laughs> it's coming so she stayed in her house and um, waited for people to tell her that it was safe to come out. And there was a, a clergyman, maybe he's a reverend, from one of the churches on Pequonic Ave. They had, they had lost their steeple in the storm. They knew that, you know, so they were one of the first ones to kind of walk into the neighborhood and ask if anybody needed help. And I asked him to go and check on my friend. And he brought them out of the house and of course like, Quite a few people they were barefoot you know you're in your house you have your shoes off she didn't want her children walking on glass she so she just stayed in the house and he was the this reverend was the first one to come through um and he was very helpful because he helped me find this family that we knew was was not emerging from their house um but we have a whole different system now the, the, we had no police come in, we had no fire people come in, no ambulances, nothing for, for a long time. They just didn't know what happened. Nowadays it would be different, I think. Yeah, and we, we interviewed him, Reverend Silver. Uh, oh, okay. Chronic, and he, it's very interesting you, you say it that way because he said when he walked over into the neighborhood, it, he said it was so quiet because it, every, it, every, people were inside mm -hmm. and, and all that. But he said it was like, where is everyone? You know, there was no police yet. He said it felt like a half an hour. Or oh, at so. least. Oh, it was closer to an hour, I think. And he, and he just thought it was eerie, you know, to be walking uh, along this destru destruction and um, no, you know, no help was there yet. And he, so he said he walked around to see what he could do. And um, so that was interesting. And I found him. Yeah. <laughs> or he found me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. we interviewed somebody the other day, um, uh, two, two people um, who were on Oxcart. Um, they actually went to school with me, um, the Corbett's. Um, they were almost, I think they were like the second house in. They, were, they weren't, they were one house from the corner. Um, uh, they were on, the, if you go down Oxcart, they were, they, were, they were Brown Shingles house on the uh, left. Okay. But they were 14 years old, mm -hmm. 14 years old getting off the bus. Um, so their perspective, um, you know, was similar to yours. They were physically outside when it happened, um, right. which was a definitely, you know, different. Um, but one of the things they talked about was that you definitely, they went to a neighbor's house too, once they could get, mm. get where they needed to yeah. go, um, that you really took care of each other. At, yes. You know, Yes. In those first couple of hours. We definitely, definitely um, took care of each other. And, and I'm, I'm always an optimist. It just, 
it's my nature. So when one woman was crying that she lost everything, I'm like, no, you didn't. You've got your children and we're fine. We'll survive this. We'll, 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 we'll all get past it. I mean, that's, that's who I am, my attitude from the very beginning. I mean, I was sort of protective of my friend Marilyn because she obviously was visiting my house. I felt responsible. She didn't live too far away. Um, her, her house got some water damage the, where she, she was a renter, she'd known it. Um, but there was some water damage in, in her apartment. Um, but, uh, and of course her car was destroyed in, in my yard. But I felt responsible for her to make sure she got home. Respon you know, worried about various people in the neighborhood we didn't, we didn't see. And you but. just touched on something that I, never, I didn't ask anybody yet, your cars. So, oh. was everybody's cars just blow, your windows all blown out? I had a I had a car that was only a couple of months old, so it was not totaled because it was new enough that they had to replace all the windows and a new paint job, and that car rattled with broken glass for as long as I owned it because the glass would fall down in the doors and they never got it all out. Yeah, when, when you lose your house like this, you get to coordinate the house inside, outside, your clothes, your car, you could just re <laughs> everything. Insurance, insurance asked us to itemize everything we had in the house. And it was like, are you crazy? Itemize everything? And they actually helped us in some ways. Oh, you, you, you must have had this and you must have had that in your house. and and. Um, and they were they were they were helpful, but I had to do like this mental walk through. I managed to salvage um, a book from my wedding that had all my wedding gifts listed in it. It should not be very helpful. <laughs> um, is there, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure people know about your story and 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 how? I'm it trying you? to think. I. I I know that it was an unusual day because it was Wednesday and the kids were all home from school early. Had it been a different day of the week, it would have hit at three o'clock. That If a tornado had come at three o'clock on a different day of the week, it would have hit uh, the time that school was being let out. And there would have been all of those children in the school and in the schoolyard. Um, it turns out there was some like Cub Scout groups or something meeting in the school. There were a few after school activities, but really no, no children. Uh, not like they would have been, that would have been a way, way more huge disaster. I mean, the school was closed for a year. You know, I bought a house to be right next to the school. My kid goes to kindergarten. He's got to go by bus to another, another school. <laughs> But well, and the aftermath must have been um, making adjustments for a long time, living yeah. outside your comfort zone. That must have been very, for, for your kids, yep. you know, that, that must have been a, a difficult thing just to, because that was your new normal that you had to deal with. For a As for, that was a terminology that I used a lot. It was a new normal, yeah. Um. Um, all right, well, I... Anything else we didn't touch on? I think. I don't know. I've got my um, my original story with me that I left with uh, the the uh, um, the Windsor Historical, Historical Society. Um, I looked at that. If I looked at that, it might. Yeah, do you want me to bring your bag over to sure. you and, and sure. want to look at it? I have both my notes, my crazy notes from the, uh, when I wrote the original, original story. Um, I had another child at my house right beforehand. 
Um, my, there had been another little boy that was at our house playing with Karen and Michael, and he got a call from another child and, and who said, come play with me, and, and he was kind of torn. Did he stay with Michael, or did, he, or did he go off with this other kid, and he decided to leave, and I said, don't go, it's raining, and it, it, I don't want you out in this weather, and he said, no, no, I want to go, and he ran off. When the whole tornado hit, I totally had forgotten that this little boy had left my house. I found out afterward he took a shortcut home. He went where his mother said, never, don't go home that way, always go this way, and he went the other way, and so he got home to safety. Had he followed her instructions, he would have been outside. It, it, a lot of things just went right. I mean, I, I ended up with a, with a very nice house. Year, within the next few years, my husband started to make more money. Had we been in the original house, we probably would have sold the one that blew down, moved into something very expensive. Then with things the way they went later on, we never would have been able to afford to keep. But because we were in a house that was brand new and we had built it reasonably, when we went through a period of time that we were in negative income, we were able to stay there. There are so many things that I look at that tornado as a blessing for. I mean, that third child was, is, is a very, very special young man in many, many ways. It just, I, I have a very different perspective than a lot of people when it comes to that tornado.